All right, good evening, everyone. Let us, let us begin. So tonight, actually, we're going to go in a little bit of a different order on a variety of levels. First of all, we're going to begin with the parsha. Again, begin a little bit with Parsha's Tetzave, and we're going to jump a little bit out of order in our journey through Sefer Tehillim, because whereas we're up to Kapitel 69 of the Kapitel Samech Tes, we're going to jump back tonight just to Lam and Dalid, because it fits together so beautifully with this week's Parsha, and then Amir Tzashem, in the coming weeks, we will resume our, our normal progression. So we begin again with the opening psukim of this week's parasha, Parsha Stetzave. First of all, Shir tonight is dedicated by the Engelsberg, Dinovitzer, and Steinberg families. Le'ilu'i nishmas harab Yitzchak, David ben Meir, Aryeh Zichron of the Brach, we open the merit of our Talmud Torah, the Neshama will have an aliyah, and the family in Nechama. So we take a look at number one. The Ato Tetzave Spenei Yisrovi, Chuei Lecha, Shemen Zayis Zoch, Kasis la ma'ar la halos the ner tabin. So Baruch Hu tells Moshe Rabbeinu, you shall command the Jewish people, they should bring to you Shemen Zayis Zach. So the truth is, we often translate this as virgin olive oil. Remember, again, Rashi points out to something very interesting, that when you crush olives, the first oil that comes out, that's called Shemen Zayis Zach. The subsequent oil that comes out is still Shemen Zayis, but for the menorah, one was only permitted to use the first pressing of the olive. So again, Shem and Zayzach, virgin olive oil. So Hashem says to Moshe, command the Jewish people, they should bring to you Shem and Zayzach, kasis la ma'ar, la ha'alos ner tamid. And again, ba'oel ma'oid michus la baruch has a yaroch also aron ubanav me'erev ad bokir lefnei Hashem, chukas olam ludoro sameis p'nei Yisrael. Then Hashem tells Moshe, this oil, is going to be used to kindle the menorah. The menorah shall be arranged inside of the Mishkan. So the question that almost all the commentaries have is as follows. If you look at the parshios of Truma, Titzave, Vayakel, Pekude, because they're really all the unit, there's a very interesting distinction. Parshas Truma is the parsha where Hashem commands Moshe Rabbeinu to gather all of the necessary materials. So whatever you're going to need to literally allow the Mishkan to function, gold, silver, copper, brass, purple wool, red wool, all treles, all different kinds of things, that's in Parshas Truma. Kalim utensils in Parshas Truma. Parshas Tetzave is much more focused on the big day kahuna, kohana clothing, which then raises a simple question. Why is the command for oil in Parshas Tetzave and not in Parsha's Truma. In other words, oil, we would classify it as what? How would you classify oil? A material. It's a material, right? Again, it's the same thing as gold, silver, copper, all this. But yet again, it's separate from everything in Parsha's Truma and stated on its own in Parsha's Tetzave. Now remember, to make this even just a little bit sharper, even the menorah itself, the command to build the menorah, is in last week's Parsha, right? The menorah is not here. The menorah is in Parsha's Truma. So wouldn't it make sense to place the commandment regarding the oil together with the menorah in Parsha's Truma? So the, all the Mepharshim struggle with this basic idea, why is the oil mentioned separately? So there are a number of commentaries. I want to share with you one approach, the al -Sheikh. The al -Sheikh says something truly beautiful in sources 3 and 4. He writes, Vizos kavanas tiyak, vizos tiyak kavanas So the al -Sheikh says, the al in general is a more esoteric, Kabbalistically based parish. And he says as follows, So, so the al says, 
Put yourself in Moshe Rabbeinu's shoes for just a moment. Moshe Rabbeinu was watching everything that is going on around him. The Jewish people are commanded to go ahead and donate, right? So they donate all of the various materials. And B'Tzalel and Alihav and many of the other craftsmen, their responsibility is to go ahead and actually create and fabricate the Mishkan. And then he goes on and he says, Ves Aaron, Ves Banav Lechayin, Lefanav Yisparach. And Aaron and Aaron and his sons are to be the Kohanim. So Moshe, so the Avshach says something amazing. Moshe Rabbein was looking around. And what does he see as he looks around? Everyone has something, right? So the Jewish people are commanded to bring the materials. B'Tzalel and Aliyah and their team of craftsmen are charged with the actual creation, fabrication, construction of the Beis HaMikdash. Aaron and his sons are inducted into the kahuna. Everyone has a job. Everyone has something to do except, except Moshe Rabbeinu. Except Moshe Rabbeinu. So interestingly enough, so first of all, you would think to yourself, it's not totally true, but if anyone needs sheets, there are sheets right, I don't, I don't know if there are sheets in the back, but there are sheets right up here on the front table. Oh, on the back also? Wonderful. Great. So it's interesting to note, by the way, that you would, is, is that true? Does Moshe Rabbeinu have nothing to do? What, what, what did Moshe Rabbeinu do? So super, uh, everybody loves being the supervisor, right? So he was a supervisor. But the truth is, even before supervisory role, right? Remember again, he's the fundraiser, right? As someone who does a lot of fundraising these days, right? That, that is a very big and important job. Here was the difference. Moshe Rabbeinu had the best possible fundraising scenario, which was there were no one-to-one -one meetings. There were no parlor meetings. There was no group meetings. There was none of that. Moshe Rabbeinu put out the call. And remember again, what happened? Everybody came, too much, too much, unprecedented. It never happened again throughout the history of the Jewish people where an organization said, too much money, stop coming, please. We don't want any more, we're done, right? So interesting, even from a fundraising perspective, Moshe Rabinu doesn't really have a heavy lift. So the al Sheikh points out something amazing. You know, you ever see, some, this happens sometimes where like, you see such excitement happening all around you, all around you. And you want to be involved. You want to have a chilek. You want to have a peace. But you're not sure what your place is in, in, in everything. So the al says, Moshe Rabbeinu sees all of this excitement around the Mishkan. Everyone has a part except me. Except me. And the al says the last two lines in number three. Halo yischametz levavo leymar mazos asa elokim li. Moshe Benu thought to himself, Zalofer, Zalofer, I have no part in all of this. I have no part. Remember again, there's another piece to this. You know, it's always interesting to note, you know, we all walk around with our baggage all walk around with our baggage. I mentioned this many times. Everybody has baggage. You know what the difference just is, right? Some people travel light, right? Some people just have a carry-on, and some people are buying extra pieces of luggage. Some people have to hire a porter, right? But everybody's got, everybody's got, right? I, I always give this muscle, but I think it's so profound. You know, you ever travel, you ever travel somewhere, and this often happens, especially if one has the privilege to travel with family. And you know, like you ever take a family trip and, and you're schlepping everything, right? You're schlepping everything and you get on the plane and then there's the struggle to put the baggage in the overhead compartment. And this one's putting his bag there, this one putting this, and it's a whole to do. And you ever see that person who gets on the plane, right? And they have nothing, right? They're coming, there's like a carry-on that's like the size of a Ziploc bag, right? And their laptop fits in their pocket and it's so wonderful and they're walking and they go and they sit down and they're drinking and they're this and they're that. And you're like, wow, well, like, I want to be that person. It's not just true on airplanes, it's true in life as well. Everyone has baggage. Everyone has baggage. Some people choose to check their baggage. Some people choose to simply cast off their baggage. And some people take their baggage wherever they go in life. Wherever they go, wherever they go, there's a U-Haul, right? There's a U-Haul behind them, lugging around and schlepping around all of the life baggage. It's interesting to note, even Moshe Rabbeinu has baggage. What's Moshe Rabbeinu's baggage? Moshe was supposed to be the Kohen Gadol. 
Bosh Shabbat was supposed to be the Kohen Gadol. That was his original destiny. When did he lose that? He lost it by the Sneh. The Gemara says that by the burning bush, when Hashem tells Moshe, you're supposed to be the leader, and Moshe said no. Okay, the first time is humility. The second time is humility. Maybe even the third time is humility. But after a certain point in time when God calls upon you to do something, there's only one answer, which is yes. Yes, absolutely. Fine, I'll do it. Moshe Rabinu, because of his constant reluctance, lost the Kahuna Gidola. So Moshe Rabinu, now again, now Moshe Rabinu, it's not like Moshe Rabinu doesn't have what to do, right? Even if he lost the Kahuna Gidola, he's still the Navi, he's still the prophet, right? He's still the lawgiver he brought to the from our Sinai. But now, when everything is all Mishkan focused, it, it hurts. The baggage comes back. Every once in a while, even if you manage your baggage well, usually there's a trigger event. There's something that happens that once again brings my baggage to the forefront. For Moshe Rabbeinu, the trigger event was the Mishkan. I have no place. I have no responsibilities. I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm doing. I was supposed to be the Kohen the Gadol. And now what am I? So it says the al the Ashik sets the table. That's how Parshas Tetzave opens up. Moshe Rabbeinu lost. And it's fa- isn't it fascinating? Because if there's one person you would think who was like never lost in life, it was Moshe. I would have thought it was Moshe Rabbeinu. Right? He always speaks to Hashem. He has such clear direction, such clear life choreography. Right? The Kashbar who tells him what to do, how to do it, when to do it. There's really very little ambiguity in Moshe Rabbeinu's life. And it's very, it is very life affirming that even a Moshe Rabbeinu has periods of time where he just feels lost. I just feel lost. And that's the beginning of Parashat Tetzaveh. So it says the al Sheikh in number four. So what does Hashem tell Moshe? And this is really incredible. So the al says something amazing. He says, how should you read the opening verse of the parsha? Va'ata. Va'ata is Hashem speaking to Moshe. Va'ata, Moshe. Moshe, you. I don't want you to worry about anything. al don't be upset. Don't feel lost. Don't feel forlorn. Ki godol mikulam. Because you, Moshe, you see, you think you have no portion. You think you have no place. You think you have no part. But in fact, you are the most important person in this entire process. He goes on, Ki halo shleimus kulam al yadchahu. Everyone else could only do their part because of you. He goes on, Ki ha'idei ma sha'ata tetzaves b'nei Yisrael b'chal ha'mitzus, v'gam ma sh'yikhu elech ha'shemen, sh'yisku, Moshe, again, it was mentioned a supervisory role, but not just supervisory role. The people know what to do because you give them the instructions. Aaron and his sons are only inducted into the kahuna. How? Because Moshe, you induct them. So nothing happens, Moshe Rabbeinu, without you. The fundraising, you. The instructions to the craftsmen, you. The kahuna gidola, you. And Hashem teaching Moshe Rabbeinu, you're upset. You're upset because you feel you don't have a place because you feel that you don't have a defined mission. Right? You see, everyone else had a defined mission. But Salel was an architect. Aliyah was an architect. Aaron was a Kohen Gadol. The sons... Kohanim had Yotim, regular Kohanim. This one donated gold. This one donated silver. Everyone has a specific area in which they focus. And Moshe Rabbeinu feels that the lack of job specificity means that he doesn't matter. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells him, you're missing the point. You are the enabler of everyone else's growth. It is because of you that everyone else has the ability to do what they're going to do. It's great to be the Kohen Gadol, and it's great to be the architect, and it's great to be the guy who gives the gold or the silver or the copper or the this or the that. But Moshe, you're the enabler. You're the glue. You're the one who allows everyone to do their respective parts. He goes on, he says, Ultimately, again, Kadosh Baruch Hu tells Moshe Rabbeinu, essentially, you are the enabler of everyone else's growth.
Now, this al Sheikh by itself is teaching us a really incredible idea, which is that sometimes the greatest accomplishment in life is not what you do for yourself or by yourself, but it's the ability to enable others to become great as well. You see, again, we often measure success. We often measure success by personal accomplishments, which, which is not a bad thing. I don't mean personal accomplishments like, like petty things, but if we measure, what, what, how, do, how do I measure, right? Isn't it the million dollar question? How do you measure a successful life? What is the metric of a successful life? So often again, and I ask myself, well, it, it depends. If you're a man, if you're a woman, there might be different metrics of success. But often those metrics are in terms of things that we accomplished. And personal accomplishments are absolutely part of the metric of success. How holy I am, how ruchni I am, how charitable I am, how giving, how kind I am. If I'm a Baal Chesed, these are all things. But what about my ability to enable others to grow as well? You see, if all I do in life is focus on me, if all I do in life is build me, that's good, but it's limited. When you enable growth in others, that becomes a force multiplier. So suddenly again, my accomplishment is not just me, but my accomplishment really actualizes through all of the other people whom I enable to grow as well. The Nitziv writes this idea by Avram Avinu, that the Pasik says, Hashem tells Avram Avinu, that I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, that Avram is going to be an Av Hamon Goyim, a father of a multitude of nations. Okay? Or Avram Avinu is going to be, his offspring are going to be like the stars of the sky. I don't know, the Jews have never been like the stars of the sky, never like the granules of sand by the ocean. That doesn't seem to be in our cars, it doesn't seem to be our destiny. So what's the pshat? That a Baruch Hu tells Avram Avinu is the father of a multitude of nations, right? His offspring are like the stars of the sky. Avram Avinu was an enabler for Ruchnius in the world, right? If you think about it, fascinatingly enough, all of the major religions in this world trace themselves back to an Abrahamic patriarch. Avram Avinu was the one who enabled mankind, mankind, to find spirituality. Isn't that absolutely amazing? You know, we claim Avram Avinu is ours. He's our father. Eloke Avram, Eloke Yitzchak, Eloke Yaakov. But Avram also had Yishmael, right? And he also had other children other than Yitzchak and Yishmael. And the parashas Chai Sarah, he had other children. He had other children with other wives. Right? So he, had, he had a big family. And what, what happened to them? Whatever happened, they went out. But what they went out with is the spiritual legacy and the spiritual inheritance of their father. You see, the greatness of Avram Avinu is not just what he did to build himself, it's what he did to build others also. And this is so incredibly important because all too often we focus on personalistic growth, but we forget that it is our mandate and our obligation to facilitate and enable growth in others as well. Whether it's one's children, whether it's one's friends, whether it's one's kihila, whatever it might be, a person is always obligated to look out and to say, what can I do for you in order to allow you to become the best version of yourself? What could I do to enable you to grow as well? A certain sense of selfless growth. There's selfish growth, and I don't mean selfish in a bad way. I mean selfish growth, growth of the self, but then there's also the ability to enable growth in others. Second Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu, you're upset, you feel slighted, you feel marginalized, you feel like you're living on the periphery because you don't have a specific responsibility. But the lack of specificity in your responsibility highlights the fact that you have the greatest responsibility in all. Enabling growth in all of Kalal Yisrael by allowing them each to actualize their personal peace. That's the al -Sheikh. But we're going to take a little bit of a journey now into Sefer Tehillim. Take a look at, num at, at number five. So David HaMelech writes in Parak Lamed Dalet, a very beautiful idea. Le David is one of the most fascinating stories. Le David So Vayelach. So again, literally translated, Le David of David. When, when literally, again, the, the translation here, he disguised his sanity in front of Avimelech. The story is we're going to see in just a moment. David pretended like he was insane. Like he was insane in front of Avimelech. 
Vayegashehu vayelach. And Avimelech chased him away. David Melech went away. And then David Melech says in pas- number five, Pasek Beis, Avarecho es Hashem achol eis, tamid tehila so befi. I will bless Hashem at all times. His praise is always in my mouth. So remember, in our journey through Sefer Tehillim, part of the excitement of Sefer Tehillim is that often we don't know specifically what events David HaMelech is referring to in a particular capital, right? That's why we'll often see the Mepharshim, the commentaries argue, argue. They disagree in terms of what is David HaMelech alluding to. But sometimes David HaMelech is quite explicit in a particular event that generated the particular psalm. So in this case, we know David HaMelech refers to a specific episode. What's the episode here? Just to give you the context. David HaMelech is, is coronated by Shmuel Hanavi while Shaul is still king, right? Remember again, David HaMelech kills Goliath, he kills Goliath, he marries Shaul's daughter, he experiences a meteoric rise in popularity. Shaul is already suffering from an incredible inferiority complex because he already knows that he's been deposed. He didn't kill out Amalek. Shmuel said, your monarchy is over. Your son, Yonah's son, is not going to inherit. Shaul was a big tzaddik, was a big tzaddik, but he was tormented by the mistakes of his past that he could not fix. David has no interest in being king. Great, he, no, no interest in being king. He's happy to be a general in his father-in-law's army, but Shaul, Shaul is bent on David HaMelech's destruction because he is convinced that David is trying to steal the crown and steal the throne. So again, remember, it's important to understand there could be nothing further from the truth. David did not want the throne and certainly did not want to take anything from his father-in-law. He did not want anything to the point that David HaMelech chooses to flee rather than confront his father-in-law. He will not fight. He will not take up arms against his father-in-law. So he and he goes to a variety of different places. One of the places where he showed up was by Avimelech, in, or it was actually by Ochish. We're going to see right now. Take a look at number six. So the Medrash highlights the story here. Listen to this. Vayakam vadavid vayakam 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 Listen to this. Es hakol osa yofe bi'ito. Pasuk says, Hashem made everything beautiful in its time. And this is actually an incredible statement. Everything that Hashem made in His world is beautiful. Everything is beautiful in the world. So David Amal says, Hashem, you say everything you made in your world is beautiful. Third line in number six. Chachma yofe min hakol. Hashem, I disagree. There's one thing David HaMelech says that I don't think is beautiful and I don't think it makes any sense, and that's shtus. What's shtus? In this context, insanity. Why is it that there are people who are, who are insane? Right? People who just don't have mental capacity. Sometimes people who act in all kinds of strange ways because they lack das, because they lack not just wisdom, but just basic intellect. Das, what is the point? Wisdom I understand, but shtus, foolishness, insanity? He's talking about literal foolishness and insanity. Why would you create such a thing? Maha na'a b'shota hazeh. See, says, the, says David HaMelech, what benefit does the world have in a shota? Now, a shota literally is translated as someone who lacks mental capacity, someone who's deranged. So the Gemara says, what's an example of a shota? Chalan bebeisakvar, someone who sleeps in the cemetery, tears his clothing unnecessarily, someone who today we would just say is, is unfortunately unbalanced, unbalanced, potentially actually insane, right? Suffering from some type of, of mental breakdown. So David Melch says, why would you put a person like this in the world? Right? What, what, what does the world need with a shota? Adam Mahalik Bushuk, guy walks around in the marketplace, Korea Bigodov, tears his clothing. Batinokos Masachakinbo, children make fun of him. Biratsin Akharov, and they run after him. People make fun of him. Zen Noelefamecha. Shem, this is a good thing in your world? That you make a person, you make a person who doesn't function as part of normal society. You make a person who other people unfortunately make fun of and degrade. This is good. This is good. David, David, you'll see. You'll see. Okay, skip a little bit. So Hashem says, David, you'll see one day, one day, 
you'll dive into me for shtos. One day you'll dive into me for insanity. Okay, now fast forward a little bit. So what happens? So David HaMelech, now like I said before, is running away from Shaul. He's running away from Shaul. He comes to the city of Achish. Okay, now remember again, now remember, in the city of Achish is the king of Imelech. David, it's Achish Atoholich. Esmol haraktes goyas, v'halachta yom eitzel echav, v'charvo biyotcha, v'achiv shomri rosho el achish, hari adayin lo nestapa domashal goyas. Here was the problem. Tara Melech goes to Achish. Achish was the king, and also known as Avi Melech. And Achish, interestingly enough, was the brother of Goyas, the brother of Goliath. Now, there's one more piece to the story, which is, Tara Melech, when he runs away from Shaul, he runs away in the middle of the night. He has no weaponry, no supplies. Where does he stop? He stops in the city of Nov. Why does he stop in the city of Nov? For provisions. And he tells them, he lies. He lies. And he tells them, on a secret mission from the king, no one can know about it. I need provisions and I need weapons. What kind of weapons did they have in the city of Nov? Nov was the city of Kohanim. They had the sword of Goliath. The sword of Goliath. After David killed Goliath, he took his sword and he took his head. But that they didn't take with them. But the sword they put in the Mishkan. Sword they put in the Mishkan. So David, so watch this. So David is escaping Shaul. He goes to Achish. He goes to Achish, the brother of Goliath. And he shows up with the sword of Goliath. Sword of Goliath. Everyone knows that David killed Goliath. That David killed Goliath. Kevan Sheba'ilav bo eitzel Achish. Ba'amrali nerog l'mishargasachinu. So what happened? Word, word gets out that David Amalek shows up, right? Shows up and in this, in this foreign town and they tell Achish, they tell Achish the king, David's here. Here is our opportunity to exact retribution on the man who killed our brother. David Hamelech becomes very scared. But also Shad Nisyari David. He realized he walked into a very precarious situation. Hischil David Lispalova Omri Bono Lamim Aneni Bezu David Davins to Hashem, Hashem, please save me. Save me. Amala Kadish Barahu. David, Ma'ata Mevakesh. So Hashem, listen to this exchange. Hashem says, David, what are you asking for? Amarlo, Tainli Ma'at Me'osa Davar. Give me a little bit of that thing. What's a little bit of that thing? Make me a little bit insane. See, David Amalek's plan was that if he feigned insanity, people would kind of just leave him alone. They would figure he lost his mind. And they're not going to exact retribution on an insane individual. David HaMelech made himself like an insane person. What did he do? So he, David HaMelech started scribbling on the walls of the city. Achish! The king of Gat owes me, you know, Mayor Rebo, $100,000. His wife owes me $50,000. So David Amalek is walking around, and again, the Navi goes into great detail. David Amalek starts drooling, right? He's, he really puts on an excellent show as being as a totally insane, mentally incompetent individual. At the same time, Bito shal achish haisa shota, v'haisa tzo'akes u'mishtata bifnim, v'david tzo'ek u'mishtata bimbachotz. Um, Achish had a daughter, and his daughter was also unfortunately mentally imbalanced. Right? She was also a little bit insane. So, so the Navi says, Achish has a daughter who's screaming inside of the house. David Amalek is screaming outside of the palace. Amr lahem, Achish, yodim atem shechaser shotimani? Do you think, am I missing any crazy people in my life? Right? So, uh, poor Ach, poor Achish. Right? Achish has got insane people in the house. He's got insane people outside of the house. And he essentially says, you know what? Just leave David alone. The man's lost his mind. That's punishment enough. Let it go. So in that moment again, David and Melech had incredible simcha. Why did he have incredible simcha? Because he realized that even insanity has its place. Even shtus, right? Even insanity 
serves a purpose. So therefore, again, if you tie this back to the beginning of the Medrash, so the Medrash says, Zesh Amar HaKosov, Es HaKol Yafa, Es HaKol Asa Yafa Bi'ito. Everything that Hashem made in His world, everything that Hashem made in His world, ultimately, again, is for the good. Even the things that David HaMelech didn't understand that were for the good, like insanity, he realizes afterwards how ultimately, again, it has a positive purpose as well. If you look at number seven, our lady Yitzhak Abreditchev says something so beautiful here. He explains this capital. He says, Ba'osa Shah, Bishanosu as Ta'amolif Nevi Melech, Ba'yigashev Ba'yilach. So remember again, that's the capital. David Abmelech, again, at a time when he feigned insanity, Ba'yigashehu, Achish, the king of Gat, chased him away, and David Abmelech was able to survive. Mezeh Ba'alo HaYeshua. Al Kain, Avarcha as Hashem Becholis, Tomid Tihila Sobefi. So listen to this, says Rabbi Yitzchak, Ad Ata Savarti, Kirak be itim Latova, Yesh Lahodos Lashem, Ach be itim Lara, Mashevach Yesh Bolashem is Barak Shemo. So Rabbi Yitzchak says something so beautiful. David Amal thought like this I always thought in my life that life is comprised of two different types of events, or two different types of times. There are good times, and there are bad times. And when do you give thanks to Hashem? When do you give thanks to Hashem? Good times. Good times, right? Because at the end of the day, what good comes out of the bad? What good, I don't know, again, I'm a human being. I'm a human being. And again, what Dabar Melech is saying is, maybe in bad times, what's the job of a person in a bad time? What's, what's my job in times of difficulty and badness? To maintain my belief in Hashem, right? But I don't have to thank Hashem. There's, there's, no, there's no din, there's no concept of gratitude to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the midst of difficulty. And Dada said, this is always how I thought. Gratitude is a function of happiness. Gratitude is a function of good times. Gratitude is a function of tova. But when you have difficult times, right? When you have in times of difficulty, there's no, there's no hoda, there's no praise to Hashem. Again, I'll maintain my amuna, but I'm not going to give thanks. There's no gratitude. So watch this. Levi Yitzchak says, David HaMelech has an incredible spiritual epiphany. So if you go back for a moment just to number five, David HaMelech discovers something amazing. What does he discover? The David Bishanosos Tamolif Never Melech Vagashev Allah. And the episode David HaMelech says, where I feigned insanity. And it sounds like from the Medrash that almost he feigned part of it, but it's almost as if Hashem visited some level of insanity upon him. Because remember, he davens to Hashem for this insanity. So David HaMelech says, when I came out of this episode and I survived, because of the insanity. Now remember again, how did David HaMelech view the Shote? How did he view Shtus? How did he view insanity, mental imbalance, before this episode? How did he view it? Bad. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. But in the aftermath of this episode, it's that very thing that made no sense. It's the very thing I thought was bad. It's the very thing that I thought had no purpose that saved my life. And as a result, what does David say? Avarcha es Hashem bechol eis. I will thank Hashem at all times, at all times, both for the good as well as for the bad. Because what I discovered is that even from the bad, good flows as well. Even from the difficulty, even from the things that make no sense, even from the things that are illogical, even from the things that leave me wondering why. There's always good that comes from it. Tomid ti lasobefi. The praise of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is always in my mouth. So it's incredible. David HaMelech has this epiphany. I always thought that there was good in life. There was bad in life. For good, you give thanks. For bad, you accept. You accept because that's acceptance is a big thing also. I accept and I move on. But I never thought for a moment to give thanks for bad. Why would I give thanks for bad? That doesn't make any sense. Until I realized that even from the negative, even from the bad, there's positivity which flows forth. And so I discovered that my job as a Jew is to express my gratitude to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for everything that happens to me 
in life. Now watch this. Take a look at number eight. The Hassan Sofer, who is the grandson of the Hassan Sofer, says something beautiful, and he links this capital to this parsha. So watch this. So the Hassan Sofer says, you know, everyone suffers with something, right? We know that we all have our situations in life where we say to ourselves, really we say to God, why? Like why, why, why do this? Why do this? You are Kaddish Baruch Hu. You control everything. Why, why would you do this to me? Right? And, and, and by the way, it's a legitimate question. And it's okay to ask that question. Like, why, why are these circumstances being visited upon me? Amnon Be'emes. So the Hassan Sofer says, it's a great question. But he says, you have to reframe it a little bit. How so? Listen to this. He says, So the Hassan Sofer goes on a little bit, and I'm going to skip. He skips, he skips down a little bit. He says, the goal of suffering is not suffering. The goal of suffering is the good which emerges from the suffering. Now, hear him out, hear him out. Because often we hear things like this, and there's a part of us that turns off because it sounds a little bit cliche, right? The, the silver lining, the this, that, Gamzula Tova, you, you know, but, so look, look what the Hassan Zofer says. He says, if you think about, think about a person who suffered immensely in life. Think about a person who had incredible adversity. So it's interesting, you know who he chooses? You know who he chooses? Moshe Rabbeinu. It's fascinating. I would have never thought Moshe Rabbeinu in the top couple of choices. But look what he says. Skip down, a number eight, the right-hand side paragraph. Three, six, eight lines up from the bottom of the paragraph. Kimi lanu gadol mimenu. Look, Moshe Rabbeinu. Who is greater than Moshe Rabbeinu? Vem kolzos, hayemu'una, omeduka, biyisurin shonon kalyama. Moshe Rabbeinu suffered, suffered adversity his entire life. Dimiyohi v'adwar ba'al paro, nisnase biyisurin shonon mishunim. How did Moshe Rabbeinu's Rabbeinu story start? Three months old. What happens to him? Three months old. He's put in a basket on an aisle. Right? Three months old. His parents have to say goodbye to him. Remember again, he's not raised in his own home. He's not raised in a Jewish home. He's not raised by his mother. He's not raised by his father. He's raised by Paro. So three-month-old baby is cast afloat on the Nile, right? Raised in a foreign home. So you have to appreciate what the Hassan Zofar is saying. Listen to this. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't grow up with his family. So he has a surrogate family. Who's his surrogate family? Paro. What happens to the surrogate family? He's rejected by the surrogate family as well. Now granted, it's because he killed an Egyptian, but he's got to run away now from the surrogate family. So he lost his birth family. Then he loses his surrogate family. Now he comes to Midian. What happens to Moshe Rabbeinu in Midian? Hassan Sofer says, Moshe Rabbeinu never really fit in in Midian. How do we know that? Because what does he name his first child? He says, Ger Hayisi Be'eres Nachriya. Right, Gershom. I was a stranger in a strange land. He was always a stranger. He was always the outsider. Isn't this an incredible observation? Didn't get to grow up in the home of his family, rejected from his surrogate family, doesn't really find a home with his in-laws either. And then again, by the way, it goes on and on and on, right? Has to deal with the difficult people throughout his entire career. Doesn't really have a marriage. Doesn't really have a relationship with his children, right? Gives up all of the trappings of normal life. It's a really difficult life. So look what the Hassan Sofer says. Left-hand paragraph number eight. Watch this. This is the meaning of the Pasuk, the Atta Titzave. Says the Hassan Sofer, listen to this, Kai al toldosecha umooros chayecha heima mitsuvim umilamdim libene Israel. So listen to what the Hassan Sofer says. Here's the meaning of the Pasuk, the Atta Titzave. 
Moshe, do you know what I want you to teach the people? I want you to teach the people va'ata, you. I want you to teach them your life story. I want you to teach them your life story. So you say to yourself, what's the life story of Moshe Rabbeinu? Right, if you had to, if you had to condense the entire life story of Moshe Rabbeinu into one phrase, what would it be? The Hassan Sofer says, the yikhu elecha, what they can learn from you, shemen zayis zach. What they can learn from you is pure olive oil. How do you go ahead and make pure olive oil? There's only one way to get olive oil, which is how? You crush the olive. I bet the olive is so beautiful. But the olive is so fantastic. It's so pristine, right? It grew so beautiful. It's the way Hashem made it. The only way you get the oil, which by the way, is a higher form of the pre. It's a higher form, right? The oil itself has greater importance than the actual olive. The only way you get the oil is if you crush the olive. Sometimes the only way to figure out who you really are and the only way to discover what you're really made of and the only way to truly self-actualize is through pressure and through difficult circumstances. The oil only comes out when the olive is pressed, when the olive is crushed. So if you go back up, I want to show you this inside. Just go back to number one for just a moment. Go back to number one. So what you see over here, look, look how the Hassan Sofa reads the Pasuk. The Atta. So remember again, let's bring this all together. Like the Al Sheikh said, what's going on over here? What's the beginning of the parasha? Right? What's happening over here in the beginning of the parasha? Stuff? What's happening here? What's Moshe Rabbeinu's state of mind? Right? What's right? Moshe Rabbeinu is sitting on the therapist's couch, and what is he saying? How, did, how is he feeling? Right? Lost, forlorn, extra, unnecessary. Unnecessary. So who says, Moshe, there's nothing further from the truth. Here's your purpose. You need to teach. See, the, the, remember, the, the Al Sheikh said, what, what was Moshe in his task? What was his avoda? What was his avoda? What was his avoda? Enabler. You are the enabler of everyone else's growth. The Hassan Sofer says a little bit different. It's true, but in a different way. Moshe, your job? The Atta Hitzava Es Bnei Yisrael. You have to teach the people, the Atta, your life story. What's your life story? The Yikhui Lecha. Because your story is so important. Because they need to take your story and make it their own. And what's your story, Moshe Avinu? Number one, Shemen Zayis Zach. Kasis Lamaor Lahalos Ner Tamid. That the only way to get the oil of illumination, the only way to get the oil of self actualization, the only way to really discover who and what you are, is when you crush the olive of self, is when the olive is pressed, is through difficult circumstances. David Hamelech discovers, discovers, has an incredible spiritual epiphany that everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does, the good and the bad, is good because good comes out of the bad. And Moshe Rabbeinu discovers this even in a different way. That it's not just that there's good that comes out of the bad, but sometimes the very oil, the very oil of personalistic accomplishment only comes out when the olive is squeezed. Now let's be honest. No one likes this lesson. This is like the most unpopular shear Anyone come up, right? Because why? Because essentially what you're telling me is at the end of the day, the only way to really find out who you are and the only way to really discover the true depth of your personalistic prowess and kohos is through adversity, difficulty, and challenge. And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. It's a, it's a difficult pill to swallow because the truth is most of us spend our lives trying to avoid difficulty, adversity, and challenge, which, which makes sense. But first of all, you know, you could try. You'll never fully avoid it. You'll never, it'll, it'll always find you. But what a life-affirming lesson. Because so often we think that when our personalistic olive gets pressed, gets crushed, it's the end of the road. Meanwhile, it's not the end of the road. 
it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. It's now that why I realize, you know, and, and I, I think we've all seen this because I'm assuming we've all experienced crisis in some way. So there's an incredible thing that often happens in the midst of crisis. Often the first stage in crisis is my life is over. My life is over. I'm not going to be able to go on. And then the next stage is, okay, my life is not over, but it's going to be terrible. And then the stage after that is, my life's not going to be terrible, but there's never going to be simcha. And then there's an amazing progression which goes on, and over time there is simcha. Maybe it's not the same. Often it's not the same. But then there is an incredible journey of self-discovery that takes place. I never realized I had this kalach. I never realized I had these abilities. I never realized, I didn't know that I was a strong person. I didn't know it. Because the truth is when your olive is whole and intact and never been bruised, you don't know what's contained inside. It's only when it's squeezed and when it's pressed and when it's crushed that you suddenly begin to discover that luminescent oil that has the ability to burn bright even in the midst of the most difficult of circumstances. And that's what David HaMelech was giving thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I discovered that not just you have to give thanks to Hashem for the negative things in life, but that from the negative, from the crushing of the olive, comes the oil. The Ato Tetzave, Moshe Rabbeinu begins the parasha thinking that he's so unnecessary, so extra, so unimportant. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, what? What? You are the most important, not because of a particular role or responsibility that you play in the Mishkan, but because your life story is the story of success. Moshe Rabbeinu, and by the way, it's not just Moshe. There are so many examples of great people that we have throughout our history who personify this lesson, who became who they were, not despite, you see, people often think that great people become great people despite their challenges. It's just the opposite. Great people become great people because of their challenges. Because it's only when the olive is pressed that the oil comes out. Had the olive never been pressed, they would have just been ordinary people. Had Moshe Rabbeinu's basket never been set on the Nile at the age of three, right? Had the Egyptians never come looking for him, then he would have just been another Jewish slave. He would have just been another guy. It's because of the adversity, because of the crushing of the olive, that ultimately, again, he became who he was. You know, I'll end up with something amazing. There was a fascinating story, a fascinating story in the news. This was a couple of years ago about a guy by the name of Derek Amado. You'll Google him. It's quite fascinating. I'm going to read to you this story. This guy, I won't read it to you. Derek Amado is a guy. And he was playing one Sunday afternoon, I don't know, with his kids, with his friends, in the backyard. Somebody threw a football, and he was jumped, he like jumped into the pool to go ahead and, and catch the football. He didn't realize that he jumped to the shallow end of the pool. And he slammed his head on the bottom of the pool. He was unconscious for a number of days, right? This, this, happened, this happened 12 years ago. So listen to this, I'm gonna read to you. After recovering from the accident, he was at a friend's house, and walked over to a piano. Never, 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 without ever playing the piano before, he began playing and playing. The trauma to the head unlocked something unique inside Amado's brain, which is called acquired savant syndrome. Acquired savant syndrome is when a tragedy, the, the simple layman's definition is when a tragedy turns you into a genius. Without going through all the science, because I don't know the science, essentially, he knocked something in his brain that unlocked, that unlocked the skill that was stuck in there. there. There's so much knowledge, there's so many skills in our brain that we don't access. Well, he hit his head in just the right way that again, this acquired savant syndrome unlocked. The man never played piano before. He never played piano before. You, you could watch the videos. The guy plays like he's Beethoven. He plays magnificently. And by the way, he can't read music. He can't read music. No idea how to read musical notes. No idea how to read musical notes. Acquired savant syndrome, knocked his head. I thought, wow, what an incredible metaphor. That sometimes is also a spiritual acquired savant syndrome. Sometimes you get smacked in the head in life, right? 
often you get smacked in the head on life. And you know what happens initially? After you hit your head, so to speak, metaphorically, you're dizzy. Maybe you're even unconscious for a while. But the Atot Tetzavis B'nai Yisrael says, the Jew has the power of acquired savant syndrome. That at the end of the day, sometimes that knock on the head, that knock on the heart, that knock on the soul, which initially sidelines me, leaves me bedridden, right? Leaves me down and out, feeling like I'm never going to require. When I gather back my strength, I realize that I have the ability to access strength, skills, and abilities that I never knew I had before. So David HaMelech learns this incredible lesson in a moment of vulnerability where he realizes that even when the olive is pressed and it's difficult in life, the oil of spiritual luminescence and strength comes out. Moshe Rabbeinu begins Parshas Tetzave, feeling meaningless and marginalized. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells him, you're the MVP of Klal Yisrael. You're the most important person, not because of something you're doing, but because of who you are. Because your life story is the life story of the crushed olive. And although the crushed olive may be bruised and battered and limping for a while, it's only because it's been crushed, only because it's been battered, only because it's been injured, that it's discovered it's translucent oil. So we should be Zohar Merz Hashem as well. We all have moments when the olive is pressed. We all have moments when our head metaphorically hits the bottom of the pool. And we have to realize, we have to have the bitachon, that sometimes it's from those moments of greatest pain, those moments of greatest setback. It's not the pshat that, okay, we'll be able to go on. It's not just we'll be able, of course we'll be able to go on. But more than being able to go on, it's those moments of greatest pain that often give us a window into who we really are. It's those moments of greatest pain and setback that ultimately allow us to discover the oil we never realized we had. I'll stop over here for tonight. And Mir Hashem, again, if you have not yet joined the WhatsApp group, you could use the QR code on the, on the uh, source sheet to please join that way. If there are updates to the share, we'll post it on the WhatsApp group in addition to the email. Have a wonderful evening. Sometimes you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just leave, just leave it by the side of the road. Halavai. I hit on the reason why some government in Israel have failed because the leaders wouldn't tolerate that and part of the people that surround you. Right. You have, to, you have to be willing, which is a hard thing, because you have to humble yourself. And sometimes it means you're going to put the success of others before your own success. And that's not easy for many of us. I think back over the history of the last few administrations in Israel, it's like every time somebody reached a, a critical achievement, they were fired. Yeah, they were shut down. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. 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 Thank you.